Good evening. Welcome to the third in our series of webinars on topics of interest to members of the FJMC. I'm Bob Watts, Chair of Remote and Online Training for the FJMC, and tonight we will have with us Dr. Paul Davidson of Temple Israel in Sharon, Massachusetts, who will be reprising his presentation at the symposium at the Convention on the Changing Role of Jewish Men. Paul will also in his capacity as chair of Hearing Men's Voices for the FJMC, be giving a summary of what he sees ahead for the coming year for HMV. Paul is a psychologist. He works at Brigham and Young Hospital in Boston. He is also an instructor at the Harvard Medical School. He's married to Susan, also a psychologist, and they have two children, Alex, who's at the University of Maryland and just left on the trip to China, and Rachel, who just turned 16. Following Paul's presentation, we will have some clips from the presentation by Rabbi Simon at the convention on building your club. We'll also have commentary by Art Spire, one of the founders of HMV on Paul's presentation, and then a question and answer period moderated by Dave Mandel, of the executive committee of the FJMC and a leader in the northern New Jersey region. So now I'll turn it over to Paul. Thank you. What you'll see is that initially uh, men play a role uh, which is very much at the head of the house. So if you all recognize this picture from the 1950s, it's father knows best. In the 1960s, the male role is still at the head of the table, but it starts to shift and we see a little more family focus. By the 1970s, dad is just one of the people there and actually we see much more emphasis on the children. By the 1980s, the head of the household here typically is now the woman. By the 90s, the role as it's properly portrayed in television is of somewhat a buffoon and by 2013, the roles of the father are very, very different and uh, we see that they no longer are, hold the same place of honor and uh, they're relegated usually to more humorous parts, and it's usually the women who are a little bit smarter. If we take a look at the United States Census from 2010, which is the most recent, which was completed, males comprise 49.2% of the population, females 50.8, so we're just a hair under half. But if you take a look at what's been happening more recently, too, if we look at trending, you'll see those who are getting college degrees. And basically, if you take a look here, Men were studying at higher rates up through the mid-1970s, and then slowly we've leveled off. Women comprise 60% of all undergraduates, uh, and, uh, or, or a majority of undergraduates and 60% of graduate students. This is a trend in the past, now 52.5% of doctoral degrees are earned by women. This is a wonderful thing. This is very positive. However, um, we're, we're seeing the fact that anybody else, well, I see Benny Summerfield's on, cannot hear me. Can others hear me? I just, will somebody just tell me if they can hear me or is it just Benny? Thank you, Mike. Okay. So the point I was just trying to make here was that uh, we see a dramatic increase in the degrees earned by women and we slow, see a slowing of the graduate degrees earned by males. Another thing, uh, thanks Art and Bruce and Alan, uh, is that a number of the fields that are very influential in terms of the rearing of young men are now dominated by women. So the field of psychology, my field, pediatrics, social services, elementary education are dominated by women. This wasn't true very long ago. I know when I went to graduate school, was mostly males, and that's changed literally within the tw past 20 years or so. And so uh, women really provide the majority of treatment to most boys and males, and so they're learning from, primarily from women. If we take a look at what's happening in terms of salaries, we see the, the important thing to look at here, uh, these are women's uh, wages as a percentage of men's. And what you'll find is that if you take a look here, for those who are older, there's been a pretty dramatic increase um, in the percentage that women have earned, which is great. Ideally, 
we should see it should be 100%. Everybody should be paid equally, but it, it certainly hasn't. What we see, though, in the younger years is that there's very little change because now men's and women's uh, salaries are pretty uh, commensurate. So that's been a dramatic, dramatic change. One of the things we know men have done a lot more of is they've uh, been much more engaged in playing sports and are very good at playing video games. They spend much, much more time on this than women choose to. However, if we take a look in the American Jewish world, we see roughly an equal number of males and females going to college and going on to graduate studies. So we buck some of the trends that we see nationwide. Uh, and, but there is some indication that Jewish women in general may be starting to outperform their male colleagues. Let me take a look at the evolving Jewish world for men. And if you think back, uh, you'll see that initially, you know, uh, I'm starting with the upper left, this was the traditional image of the shul. And it was all male dominated. We had men teaching boys and girls really were not that involved. The break, groundbreaking of a new show. Uh, men, primarily males, because at that time people were preparing for bar mitzvah. There was no bar mitzvah. Then we start to get into the 70s, the 80s, and we see a dramatic change where now there's much more equanimity within the faith. Um, this picture over here, you might recognize this guy. This is President Obama who hosted a Passover Seder at the White House, so that's become uh, popular. We took take a look at where uh, Jewish men are involved now, and they're alongside women more politically involved. And we see a uh, uh, gay rights uh, march here, Jewish men involved. We know that teenage boys tend to be less engaged Jewishly than teenage girls. And also we tend to see that Christian men uh, a study by the Pew Trust, there's actually another study coming out by the Pew Trust that Rabbi Simon is going to be commenting on uh, fairly soon uh, that takes a look at religious involvement, that Christian men are less involved in religious life in college, uh, as Jewish men are also less religiously involved on campus than uh, Jewish women. And uh, this picture I found, this is the Hillel from the uh, College of uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Pretty typical. So we run into this conundrum, what are, what's a father to do? Because we really haven't done a great job of helping men understand how to negotiate the major milestones of the life. So uh, trying to make decisions about parenting, fathering, and so on. So why are there differences? So we can take a look first at our wiring. So are we wired differently? One of the things that we know is that boys do tend to be less socially engaged and that girls do tend to be much more socially engaged. So up in the left corner, see a boy playing with a toy gun, as most boys did, whereas the girls' play usually involves other kids and stuffed animals, things like that. So we try to take a look at other pictures of the brain. At the convention, this one seemed to be the most popular picture of the uh, week. So this explains it all, clearly, for a woman. The brain's organized differently. You see right down here, we've got a lot of chocolate, mysterious moods, unexplained behavior, a very large shopping load. Their fantasy runs wild. Um, they're into musical sitcoms, gossip, whereas men, we see the issue. Okay, We've got a very large interest in sex, beer, job stuff. We do have the lame excuse plan. That works really well. Power tool load, ball sports, things like that, and movies with explosions and babes. You know, they're somewhere at the base. So this explains a lot of the difference, I think. If we take a look at real science, though, what we find is that these are different uh, pictures of the brain. We find that men have six and a half times the amount of gray matter than women. Uh, what, and this gray matter has to do with specific information processing centers in the brain. Women have ten times the amount of white matter. So you see a lot of this white matter here in women. We see very little of it in males. White matter is that part of the brain structure which allows for connections between the brain. So the way the woman's brain is traditionally set up allows for greater connectivity. And so we see much more integrative uh, material. We run into some problems with this. And there's a, a, an institute called the Gurian Institute, which is designed to help individuals with learning disabilities. What they find is that boys account for the vast majority of failing grades, receive the vast majority of disciplinary issues. 
80% uh, of those diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder are male. More boys drop out of school and pursue higher education at a lower rate. Given the way our brains were structured, where we really were able to identify a specific task and use our gray matter to its best, uh, to learn a specific skill, boys excel. However, um, demands in, in, you know, you can take a look on this slide, the pictures of traditional apprenticeships. So in the, mini, in the middle we have, you know, uh, the cobbler apprenticed by a child, could be the son. You know, in modern movies we see the Karate Kid, Star Wars, and so on, notions of apprenticeship. Today, though, the workforce demands a much greater flexibility and multitasking. The male brain is really not set to do that quite as well as the female brain, most likely, and so that may be a part of what's going on. Another factor which becomes an issue for us today, and this is something that Chuck is fond of pointing out, is that Jewish men are much, much less likely to form long-term relationships, dating relationships, and uh, marital bonds until they personally feel that they've reached a, a level of financial or personal success. So if we're running into troubles with getting guys to feel more successful, it's also impacting their ability to engage in these long-term relationships, especially with Jewish women. So we take a look at some of the differences in terms of responsibilities that people are coping with if we go back 50 years. So in 1960, the primary roles of the man was certainly to be the breadwinner. And we would see they were primar prim uh, primarily providing by working outside the home. They did limited child care. They were responsible for the vast majority of the finances and the checkbook. Uh, they did almost all the outdoor home care and were generally responsible to, for taking care of the automobile or automobiles. If you look in 2010, men are working both inside and outside the home. Uh, I know at the convention I asked what percentage of men work inside the home or have that ability, and a majority of people raise their hands. Uh, child care is now a shared responsibility. Financial tasks are typically shared, and when I asked how many women control the checkbook, the majority of hands went up now. Men are tasked with both indoor and outdoor home care. They take care of the cars, but now they're also driving the children to uh, go on these play dates or to go to a practice. Shopping winds up being shared. Cooking winds up being shared. Coaching, activities, supports, carpools, sharing of the scheduling for the children, and now one of the things we see really, which is a big issue, the sandwich generation, much more responsibility in terms of caring for aging parents. Basically, this means guys are burning out because they have far too many responsibilities. So this is a lovely quote from Rebecca Tuhos de Bro, who said that as boys see fewer role models, the synagogue will increasingly be seen as a female space. While women often clamor to participate in male-dominated institutions, Female-dominated institutions are much more likely to drive males away. We see this taking place in the synagogue right now. There are a number of comments made by Elena Stockman uh, from the Jewish Daily Forward, uh, which I think are interesting. Uh, I'll just touch on this, uh, the, the middle one here. The Jewish community needs to enable boys to explore their gender and Jewish identity in safe and educational environments with skilled and compassionate facilitators. This doesn't happen very often. This is where something FJMC can be very involved. So, how can we address this? In Raising Cain, a book about protecting the emotional life of boys, it was stated that children with fathers who are present and active in their lives tend to be smarter, better psychologically adjusted, and more successful in school and obtain better jobs. So clearly one of the, our roles will be to try to keep guys involved with their kids as much as humanly possible. We need to recognize some of the things we need to do, recognize the differences between boys and girls, try to leverage this knowledge as a way that, so that we can help provide better education to young fathers, provide role models. Can we get him out of here? Um, sorry, that's my dog Harley barking. Uh, try to get men moved in the right direction and offering mentoring service enough. You remember before, I said that, you know, really the apprenticeship system was perfectly set up for the male brain. So when we take a look at men's clubs, one of the best roles that we can play is that of providing mentors to younger men getting involved with activities. It could be through K-Rub, it could be through hearing men's voices, you name it, we offer it. One of the other things that we know is that the more socially engaged young adults are in Jewish life with Jewish peers, the more likely they are to marry Jewish partners and have Jewish households. 
We have many, many of these opportunities we try to encourage our kids to get involved with. So Jewish men need a Jewish community. So Jewish men look for a place for putting in the worthy endeavors, developing a network. I was actually meeting, um, we just finished Shiva, but you know we're saying Kaddish uh, every day. And I just met a new member of our community. He, he moved here from uh, Roslyn, Long Island. And he was talking about his wish to come to our town, in part because he heard that there was a real great sense of community. Men need this. Women do it naturally. Men need more help in, in terms of it. connecting to tradition, volunteering, uh, empowering different traditions. FGMC, through its Mention program, through hearing men's voices, through the many trainings we offer, the workshops, the retreats, certainly the international convention we all saw are ways to do this. And they help to sensitize men to maximize emotional and spiritual influence. So what role can HMV play in all this? HMV offers many, many things that may help deal with the male issue. First of all, I believe it is the conservative movement's best chance for deep communication, not superficial communication, the kind of communication you have when we will all see somebody this high holiday who we may not have seen for a year and you say, how's everything, how are the kids, how are your parents. Um, it's, it's taking a much deeper step. Men really in their lives have very few outlets for honest discussion. This provides that link. Most synagogues members know each other, but they don't really know each other uh, in a deep way. And I will tell you, you know, from our experience in our show, HMV has probably been the most influential part in terms of getting men to know each other on a deep level, commit both to our brotherhood, but also to commit to be much more active and take leadership roles in the show. Also, as a result, HMV helps to create this sense of true, tightly bonded community, which men need and need a structure to fall into. They don't tend to create it on their own. Luckily, FJMC does this. HMV engages men you know, in their brotherhood or men's clubs. It allows for the development of listening skills, which we can not only use when it comes to FJMC programs, but we can certainly use this at home, on the job, and in other relationships. It helps promote the development of leadership skills and it can energize greater involvement in Judaism. So this is look at where we are now with regards to HMV. And those of you who were at the convention saw this huge 4x8 banner that was hanging that showed all these clubs that are participating in HMV right now. And I think it was just shy of 60 at the time. So where do we want to be two years from now? So first goal is that we want to have, we want to top 100 clubs participating in hearing men's voices. And I guarantee you, if we have 100 clubs participating, we're going to have 100 more active clubs in FJMC. We're looking at video training on demand, what I'm calling FJMC TV. And Bob Watts is one of the people who's helping to pioneer this. You're participating in this right now. This will be uh, videoed and uh, available to people in the future. We would like to do this for HMV so somebody who is in you know, a cornfield in Kansas can get access to the same HMV training that you can get in New York City or in Los Angeles. Uh, new and improved, the rapid engagement model, HMV rollout. So many people were exposed to that for the first time at the convention. We see great use of that, and we're certainly looking forward to uh, making sure that people have an opportunity to use that in many different ways, both in terms of running uh, Brotherhood and Men's Clubs program, but also in terms of uh, synagogue life. We want to work on developing more improved uh, HMV training manuals. So I know uh, our group is going to be working on creating a variety of these that will be both in paper that, but will also be available online. Uh, we're looking to create a true regional network of HMV trainers so that in every single region of FJMC you'll have uh, leadership there who can help run HMV programs. And we would love to see HMV training offered at every single region's retreat. Future expansion, the world. Ideally, at some point, we would like to have global HMV. There's no reason why we can't think about, as we are starting to get more involved with Masorti Judaism, start to bring HMV to communities in South America or in Europe, some of the people that we've met. We can also use HMV as a means of disseminating information from the conservative movement. Uh, and we, again, we see the use of HMV in expanded use within the synagogue. For example, as an alternative to a service, I know that Mark Guyver's uh, his show down in uh, St. Louis earned a torch award for having done an alternative program during the high holidays using HMV. So I want to make sure you get to meet our minions, the National HMV Committee. 
Bob Braitman, David Breslau, myself, Al Davis, Neil Feynman, Mark Guyvers, Gary Cates, and Art Spar, and we work for Chuck. So respectable me. I, he hasn't seen this yet. I hope he gets a kick out of it. Um, uh, I had fun putting this one together. And uh, for more information, views, discussion on this topic, please uh, buy yourself a copy of Jewish Men at the Crossroads if you haven't already. And that about brings my presentation to a close. Thank you very much. Okay, um, it's Bob back on, and uh, now at, Ch at Rabbi Simon's request, we're going to uh, show a part of the video of his uh, presentation at the symposium that immediately followed um, uh, Paul Davidson's uh, presentation. So this is, as I said before, an experiment in putting up uh, video in the uh, connect format and we'll see how it how it uh, works the volume is as loud as it gets so if you're having trouble hearing please turn up your your speakers yeah, a relationship and if they're successful they do so I we so essentially um, now you understand what's what's going on here oh and one other couple other factors you need to know before we talk about how does this affect your men's clothes okay um, if we take the intermarriage statistics that we have from the national Jewish population in 2000, and we overlay this over what Paul just gave us, this, this broad, broad, broad picture, there's some other things that we learned. We, um, we've come to know, we, we know, learned that, um, in the first place, that young men will, uh, this is not related to intermarriage, that young men will be hesitant to form long-lasting relationships or partnerships if they're not, if they don't feel financially or professionally successful. Now we know that our kids are, are marrying later and we're having fewer children. And we know from the slides that boys generally are beginning to up, which we can tell that they're you know, underperforming in, in college and in graduate schools uh, in terms of in relationship to women. And because they're underperforming, they're not uh, receiving the same kind of job opportunities um, that they did a decade ago. The competition is much fiercer, and our guys really are playing video games and too much sports, and they're getting by in that. And there's studies, we know this. I mean, there's a whole, go to Barnes and Noble, there's a whole literature on men's issues that sociologists and demographers are looking at. Dan Kim is at Harvard, by the way. Um, so, we, so we know this kind of stuff. Um, when we look at who our children are marrying, because we basically told our children that they should be part of the larger society, we know that they're marrying or uh, partnering with people they meet in the workforce. And, um, you know, that's a, 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 in the university. A, and so that's, that, that adds to this, because if they're not successful in, in their profession, they're going to need a different group of people in the workforce. So all of these things kind of pay, pay, you know, pay the... Um, a very challenging picture of what's happening to men, and specifically Jewish young men in, in, in North America. So our challenge is to, how do we rectify that that, that imbalance and bring it up to par? So that we're operating in an equal plane. We live in an egalitarian world. So how do we, and, and the way we need to do that is to um, do what we do much better. Okay, that, that's really really what it comes down to. How many people here are first timers? How many people here of those first timers received at least one phone call welcome to the convention? Okay, how did it feel? That's what should happen in the shul. Right? That's what you want to happen in the shul. You want to feel welcome. And when you came here, what you met lots of people. And they didn't kind of say, they didn't you know, walk by you and ignore you. They said, oh, you're, you're new here. Let's talk about your shul and about your family and about all this other kind of stuff. Well, that's, where, that's, that's our strength. Because, and, and that's what our shuls and our brotherhoods, men's clubs, are, are to a great extent, are, are lacking. So I wanted to start with that because we're trying to model in a, in a number of different kind of ways. Okay, having, having said that, let's put this in the context now of, of your clubs, because you all want to build your clubs, 
you want to get people more involved. And the question is, how, and your clubs are all somewhat different. I mean, we might have common problems, but your cultures are a little different, your shuls are a little different. Some stand for the Shema, some sit for the Shema, you know. Okay, so, um, so the question is, how do you start? Well, the first place is you have to look at the culture of your shul and say, where are we? What are our needs? And what, what is the synagogue not doing that we could do better or that we could do to supplement and help the synagogue do it? A lot of it is the stuff that we're doing today, uh, the breeding and the welcoming um, and, and the engaging. Um, tomorrow you'll hear Ronnie Wilson's film because he's not well and he can't be here. And he'll talk about his new book, Traum, Relational Judaism, which is about you need to have relationships. You know, it's not brain surgery. Uh, and one of the things he says is that we have a, our, for many of us, our relationship with synagogues is transactional. We transact for a service. I want a bar mitzvah, and when we've gotten our service, we feel satisfied, and we leave. If we want to keep people more involved and engaged, we have to abandon that, that mercantile model, and we need to begin to build, build relationships which will get people Keep up with, make people feel they're more involved. Now with us, with guys, um, I have always found that we need a mission. And the men's club needs a mission. I want to know that I leave the world a better place. I want to know that if I'm a club president, that I'm not just having a program which is like having a party, but that, I'm gonna, that I have the ability to change family lives and make a difference in the choices they make and get more people involved. And we know if they get more people involved, and we know, by the way, even with intermarriage, if the intermarriage are socially engaged in the synagogue life, their children will be socially engaged in the synagogue life. It has nothing to do with conversion. It has to do with how they feel about the shul and the relationships and the things, because we're always modeling. We're modeling from the day we, you know, the, our kids come home. And if we drop off our kids, we, one of the reasons why I take issue with people that say the, if this, the reason men are leaving is because the synagogue is becoming a, a too, too egalitarian and a feminist place is because I think men are leaving is because our fathers and our grandfathers taught us that to drop us off and, to the, and then they went and played golf. So I'm going to do it just like my dad did unless somebody intervenes and helps me, shows me that I can have more meaning by doing something else. This is what I believe, because we learn, and we're constantly learning, which is really important, going back to fatherly modeling. And by the way, this doesn't mean you, you got to put up your phone every day. What it means is that you're always modeling, that what's important to you as a Jew and as a parent needs to be told to your kids. Um, that consider themselves successful because they have a lot of fun, and some of them do really good things and they fulfill really important school needs. But um, what I also find is that in a lot of these clubs, no one has explained to the club leadership that they have a mission. So I think if you're a club leader, the language is a little bit different. Sometimes somebody says, oh, I just got elected club president. And my response is, no, you just became club president. This is a powerful thing. This is the opportunity to, to, to change lots of, to lots of things for lots of people. Let's come together and think about what we need to do. That's another thing which I think is really, if you want to engage more people, I mean, I'm, 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 this is the show I want to be a member of, that I'm a member of, okay? And, uh, and, and I look forward, as exhausting as they are, to our executive meetings and to our by convention and to the stuff we do because we bring people together to think. There's very little thinking which really happens in a lot of our synagogues. There's a lot of doing over and over and over again. Maybe the clergy does a lot of thinking and planning, but they're planning events. They're, they're not, and they're doing, working very hard, and I respect them like most of my colleagues, but, um, <laughs> but, but, they're, they're, they're doing, they're, but they're doing for us, it's like a top-down thing, and this is like, we're like a grassroots thing, which is really, really important, and, and, and I think that we need, so, we, so if, but if you bring people together to think about things, and you challenge them, how are we going to make this better? You get amazing ideas, and not only that, but you'll get, you'll get involvement. Because, I mean, one of the things that you all belong to shuls, and I'm straying a little bit, but you, most shuls, they, they send out a form every year, and they say, which committee would you like to be on? Mm -hmm. And a new member signs it up and fills it out, no one ever calls them. <laughs> <laughs> you know? No one ever calls them. Which is, and, and you go, oh, crap, you know, I volunteered, and no, you know, that's terrible. So, you wonder why you can't get volunteers. Then you get your way you can. <laughs> but if you ask people, then you engage them in thinking, and then you see their strengths and their gifts. And, and, and you'll get new ideas and fresh ideas and you can modify things. It's not just about doing the same programs over and over. Programs are like parties. Initiatives 
build one thing to the next, and then we break into groups. So, so um, one of the things that um, one of our synagogues did in Peru, which was a model which I thought was very interesting, when the kids reached the name post the name graduated from the name mitzvah, they automatically uh, went on a rotation like a medical rotation. They went uh, two months on ritual, two months on education, two months on youth activity. They, they circulated through committees in the synagogue, ending up on the board of directors when they were junior, let's say. So over a two or three year period, they, they, they did this. So they kind of learned how, was, how a synagogue worked. And then what, to make this, uh, and since a lot of these kids didn't have a lot of time, so it's one evening a month, you know, it's a meeting, right? Then they sub what they did is they went to supplement it with, with some kind of Jewish experience because a lot of Jews don't have to do high schools so these kids don't go to do high schools. So uh, what they did is they uh, would have a series of like Shabbat dinners, the services dinner, and they would have both speakers from the local community, somebody from the coalition of the homeless, somebody from the UJA, somebody from Alcoholics Anonymous, various not-for-profit organizations would come in. Now, this is a, a, a kind of a push-pull thing going on here, because the question is, why would kids want to do this, and why would parents want to do this? And then let me take you back a step behind, because to run a program like this, you have to start when you're thinking of it as when the kids are 10. So, and you say, what do high school kids most want, you know, at, at, as a result of their high school experience? Well, they want two things. They want to have sex, and they want to get into a good school. I can't provide for the first one. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be behind bars. But the second one, the second one, we could do something better. What do parents want? Their parents want the kids not to have sex and to get into a good school. <laughs> so, so that's the that's the dynamic here. So, we, so, you, so the kids go on to this thing. They we sell it to the parents when their kids are 11. Okay, and, at the, and, and you can even maybe link this with a community college. But what happens is when the kids get to the finish their junior year and they're filling out those applications, we all know what that's like, most of us do. Um, they also add something else to, to, this, to their application. They say, I just went through a two year program in not for profit management. Okay, because they've learned how to power school functions, they study with all these people in the, in the community. And so there's an, the incentive is. You want to keep the kids, which means their parents, involved in the post the thing. You have to give them something that they need that's going to enrich their life. Just like we do when we get guys involved, and all of a sudden, before they were afraid to walk into the building, now all of a sudden, after six months, they feel like they own the building. Because they have friends, and because they're involved. So that's kind of, kind of the piece that you have to have. Um, you've got to make people feel comfortable. And, and feel engaged. And that's what our shuls are. Shuls are. I mean, the, the bigger the shul, the colder the place. And yet they're all, when you walk in on a shop this morning, generally speaking, they're friendly places. I mean, we did a study, actually. And, um, it's not worth going into now. But the fact is, you walk in, let people welcome you. You sit down, everything else. You might not know what's going on, but, but, but it's, a, it's, it's okay there. But we haven't told people that what happens in this, you know, the sanctuary is only one, one small part of what happens in a synagogue. You know, we're kind of the entry point for a lot of people to get them to that point. That's our function. That's our, function. We're, our job is to get guys and through, and through them and their families, if we can do it, more engaged and, and involved in Jewish life. They've made a step. They've joined the shul in many cases, which is a big thing in this world. If, you know, our job is to make, if we involve them in life, it'll provide them, it'll, it'll enrich their lives with meaning and their families and, and hopefully provide for continuity for future generations. And so I said, tell me, do you have any, what are your problems? He says, we can't get young people involved. Young, I don't know what young people meant at that time. There are no young people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, young people in the hospital. But anyway, uh, uh, but anyway, so, um, but I, I, said, I said, he said, we can't get young people involved. I said, well, tell me about your the program that you use, and he said, we had, what's your best program? He said, we just had a great program. I said, what was it? He said, we had a, a post-colostomy workshop. It's not working. I shouldn't get frustrated. But go on, because the job that you're doing is so is so much more important. And you just that's the way it is. Okay. Thank you. That um, you can view the whole symposium and the whole video online at uh, uh, with the, from the link to the fjmc.org site and. Um, Thank you.
and now I will put um, Art Spar on. Art is on, and uh, Art, uh, I'll ask you for some commentary. You, you're familiar with the with Chuck's presentation anyway from being from seeing it at the convention, so you can well, kick off. Um, thanks, Bob. The, um, uh, Paul, I, I, I was taking some notes while you were talking, and um, uh, the thing that I, I started to write down several times uh, that I thought was really important was your statement that men need help in forming community. Um, you also said uh, men need structure. Um, you said that the goal was deep communication and honest communication. Um, I think uh, it would be a, a good topic to throw open to uh, everyone on this call uh, for their ideas is how are we going to uh, provide this structure? Uh, what help uh, can we give men in informing community? So do you want me to comment or is everybody going to comment? Oh, I, I thought um, that uh, we got a lot of people on I'd the phone call. Well, I'd be interested in, in hearing what they have to say, but um, I, I I'd be happy to. I want to hear what I, other I people have to say. Certainly, the the goal here is to be as interactive as we possibly can be without being uh, together in person. So the notion of needing help and structure is long standing. You know, men have often excelled in situations where there is a clear hierarchy. So for example, if you take at leadership roles or governmental systems or police forces or the military, these are all tightly regimented organizations where men really exceed. Uh, you used to see this also in hospital organizations, in academia as well. And I think men have a, a harder time when they don't have the natural links built in. And again, what I'm saying is that women naturally tend to gravitate towards creating those social bonds much more readily than men do. So, you know, for my money, I think FJMC is one of the best organizations out there to provide that. The structure that is provided by the Federation helps each of our clubs function a little bit better and makes you feel that you're part of something bigger. The thing that's nice is that when people start to get involved with a brotherhood or a men's club, you start out small, you start out very locally, and there are programs though that allow you to be part of something much bigger. Say the Worldwide Wrap or the Yellow Candle program. Uh, and little by little it gives you an opportunity to meet more people. So I think you know one of the things that we can do best is typically to provide some sense of mentorship. Not that it has to be anything fancy, but if you took one man this year, if every one of us who's attending this conference call or who belongs to FJMC at some point, found one man that you befriended, that you tried to help out, and kind of show the ropes. How do you get involved with your show? How do you get involved with your men's club or brotherhood? How do you participate in something from FJMC? You are much more likely to uh, see that they will they will do very very well. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, many males, young males now, uh, again lack these male role models. So what I'm going to suggest that we could do better too is engage the younger men in our communities, the younger men in our shows. So these are the guys who have the very young children who say, hey. I'm too busy. I've got too much going on to take off the time to go to these meetings, to go to these activities. One of the things we could start to do is tailor more uh, activities toward this, toward this group and try to provide them not only with an opportunity for some recreation but also the ability to get a little parenting advice from people who have uh, been there before. Um, you know, again, HMV is a perfect way for people to learn these things and we could develop uh, HMV programs specifically targeted to uh, this. The notion of deep communication is something that, again, I feel uh, you know HMV provides very well. KRU provides this very well. People who have had mentioned training, L, you know, people who have gone to LDI, all of you have learned how to listen better to others, and I think that's really one of the things that we may want to roll out more of is how do we uh, learn to listen a little bit better to improve our communication. 
too often when we're talking to somebody else, we're focused on, when we listen to them, we're focused on, well, what's the next thing I'm going to say, rather, rather than hearing what they're going to say. Last night, one of our Brotherhood programs is Tennis on Tuesday. So every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock, we play tennis together. And we met, uh, a friend and I met another young man who showed up. No sooner had we turned around than my friend turned to me and said, what was his name again? It had literally been no more than five seconds. So I think this is endemic to what we do. So before we can learn, you know, to truly communicate deeply, we first need to help men learn how to listen more carefully. And I think that may be something that through HMB and FJMC we could do a little bit better. Um, now, for the next part of this, uh, Paul, and uh, and our audience, uh, guys, uh, I'm going to have, I ask you to submit your questions and comments uh, via the chat box, and Dave Mandel uh, is going to join us in, in uh, looking at your questions and feeding them to Paul to uh, move the discussion forward. And uh, Dave, do you want to show yourself for a second? <laughs> Uh, there he is. You can turn the camera on. Hey, Dave. Hey, everyone. There he is. Okay. Okay. Right, Dave, I'll... you want to introduce yourself briefly? Sure. Um, I'm Dave Mandel. I am a past president of the Northern New Jersey region. I'm newly appointed to the executive committee and look forward to. Uh, a lot of exciting things under Miles' administration. I am uh, in my mid-50s. I've got um, three daughters who are uh, all 20 and you know 20 to 23. So I am uh, very very versed in dealing with women's have to do with. One of the interesting things I actually would like to start out with a question to Paul. Talk uh, a lot about what the current environment is and how men are not getting the opportunity to, um, you know, because some of the experiences that men have as they're growing up are not the same as what they were when many of us were younger. Is the uh, like we're, we're in as far young as in school, the games that the boys are even able to play are now being severely limited and probably have been like that for the last 10 or 15 years. Is that the kind of activities that really facilitate boys and men? It's an interesting question at, at because what we see is that most boys and men organize their social lives around activity. Um, whereas women typically are quite comfortable organizing social life around discussion. So as we back away from a lot of the kind of games and sports that uh, we might have participated in on a regular basis, I think you're right. I think boys are robbed of the opportunity. Um, you know, I'll give you a good example of this. When I was growing up, uh, we, I grew up in a community where we played a lot of soccer. And I was never a great soccer player, but the expectation was, you're a boy, you played. So at recess, we would sometimes have 60 or 70 kids playing soccer. We'd just run around with a ball, and we'd have 30, 40 people on a side. After uh, school, we would go, and we would just play pickup games. Now when my children you know, go and get it, start to get involved with sports, they're tracked very readily into teams that are very, very competitive, such that if you are really not at the highest level, you're left out. And so these kids don't have as many of those opportunities. There's also been a turning away from, you know, in some places, somewhat more violent sports. There's a lot of uh, concern about concussions and so on. So certainly while there are good reasons to avoid some of these things, we are seeing fewer, uh, fewer opportunities, uh, fewer uh, unstructured activities, I will say, in which boys can set their own rules, start to create pecking orders and learn how to structure. So I think you're right on, on target that you know our experience was much more different. We were much more responsible for creating our entertainment. Nowadays most things are programmed and the things that are programmed uh, the boys have very little opportunity to influence the way they go. So I, I think that probably has a deleterious effect. Let's go into some of the questions. 
David Handler is asking, should men's clubs... Good question. Um, I think there's a reality to some of the shows in terms of getting people involved. In our show, we have a very, very strong brotherhood, and the sisterhood has been much weaker. I've seen many shows where the sisterhood is very strong and the brotherhood is weaker. My bias is anything that's going to involve more people in a Jewish life where they feel like they're getting social support, educational, spiritual support, it's a good thing. One of the things that we've tried to do, especially to engage younger men, is provide much more programming where men and women are invited to participate. The number of men-only events, you know, the percentage of that has been declining over time. Because our sisterhood has been in a somewhat weakened state, we've actually been trying to build them up because we feel that any time you want to you know, create a stronger uh, synagogue, a stronger community, whatever any arm can do to help the other is uh, going to be in everybody's best interest. So um, I, I think just my personal opinion is you're not going to tremendously weaken your club by doing some of your activities, certainly not all of them. But some of them with sisterhood or other other groups in the show. Okay. Uh, Bruce's comment: providing a forum for men to express themselves fully and safely can be transformational. Creating these venues or talking circles is a no-lose situation. Uh, Bruce, is there a that sounds like an outstanding comment to comments? me. And Bruce is an expert. That's, okay. Okay. Bruce continued his comment down below. He said, getting men together in a talking circle and following the three rules, it can't go. The most important rules in any H and B program. I'll I'll just say it really quickly. Most important three three rules are number one. Everybody, whatever whatever is brought up in that should stay in there. That you there's a certain confidentiality that should be experienced. So that while people who attended a program may want to talk to each other about what happened, outside of that group, you should not be sharing what was said. You may share some generalities, but nothing specific. There has to be a sense of safety and privacy in order for that to work. Number two, you should really focus on yourself. Talk about what you have gone through rather than talk about somebody else. And number three, another crucial rule is that this is not a place for people to be putting others down or in any way denigrating their comments. Uh, this should be a safe place. And if you live by those simple rules, I can almost guarantee that you'll have a very, very successful uh, program. And once people realize that people live by that, they put their faith in it, they put, put their trust in it, and then the level of communication becomes very, very deep and uh, very meaningful. Okay. Um, Barry Landau has a question or well, a comment and then a question. He was impressed by HMV at the FJMC convention. His men's club doesn't do HMV. He'd like to see more of this, but in his shul it's difficult. Many men live far from the shul. Evening programs are difficult for working men, particularly with children. And sisterhood is also having difficulty getting women to participate. How does a, you know, someone in a shul who sees that HMV can be successful but the club well, there are a number of different ways. It's an excellent question, it. Barry. Um, and first of all, I don't know where you live. Um, if you can type in where you live, that would be helpful too. Because one of the things I was going to say is in order to get something off the ground, we have people who are trained facilitators at this. We have uh, mention who are around the country who may be willing to come to your show and help get something set up. I'll give you a couple of examples from our area. So, uh, Barry, let's see. It says, Bruce Seaboard. So you already have, you, you've got Bruce Gordon who's willing to help you out, which is awesome. Um, I was going to say, in our area, we have a couple of shows that are very, very tiny, and they weren't able to get a program off the ground. So we invited them to join us. So one of the easiest ways to get started with HMV is find a club near you who's doing it already. Try to get a few guys to go to a few of those uh, meetings, and uh, chances are once they go, they'll understand the power of it, and they'll probably want to bring it back. Number two, 
we then um, we, we have invited others to come join us, as I said. And I hope those who are listening, and Bruce, since you're in Seaboard, if you know a few people out there uh, who are near where Barry lives, you, you can maybe get him uh, to come to, to your programs. But the other thing I was going to say is that as a facilitator, we're willing to travel a bit. And uh, I, there was a club that wanted to get a program started. They had a good group, but they just didn't know how to do it. So we had somebody come out. I, I came out to them. I know Gary Cates has been doing this an awful lot in California. Um, we've also set this up with uh, Marty Melnick in, in Connecticut. They're trying to get their program started. So we did phone consultation. And you know, I, I would certainly be more than happy to be a, a phone consultant for you uh, and try to help set, answer the questions and so on. If the evenings are difficult, maybe you could do it around the time of uh, maybe Sunday school drop-off. Um, one of the things that was suggested by others is do it at the end of a service, say a Shabbat service where you have people come get together. The, you know, the opportunities are infinite in terms of the wrinkles you can put on it. I know Art Spar and his group, they have a hard time you know, getting people to stroll, so they do it a social lot, you know, hour and they go out to a uh, restaurant in Manhattan and they get a bunch of guys going out to have a bite to eat and have a drink and they have a, you know, a discussion there. So there are a lot of possibilities that uh, may be worth trying and again, we're more than happy to help you out with this and I know Bruce uh, volunteered. You can't do much better than that. Okay, Craig Artell is talking about that they've got very similar challenges in getting sensitive topics embraced by members. They've had uh, some interesting HMP programming over time, but getting it into another the great question. Topics, you guys have awesome questions. Have I think it's a developmental kind of issue. You know, when we started doing HMV um, quite a few years ago, we started with what I would consider somewhat some softer topics. Um, we went towards areas where people could talk very easily. For example, work and worth, the discussion groups, and, and again, FGMC has published a number of manualized volumes about HMV programs that you can just follow. They give you all the questions, all the background information you need to run them. Find some things that are easy to talk with. I think it's just like trying, you know, as a psychologist when I'm working with a patient. You know, one of the things you find, it's not easy to get somebody talking about the really deep stuff very early on usually. You have to warm up a little bit. You need to kind of break them in a little bit to that and develop a sense of trust. I think that's what happened. So what we started to do with our programming was we would create an easy, what I call an easy HMV program. So talking about occupational things are relatively easy. Talking about sports or activities such as that are relatively easy. Starting to talk about parenting and dealing with issues with your young kids is relatively easy. Then we start slowly year by year. There's a progression in which you start to create more intimate discussions. And I would not rush it because if you try to move too quickly, you're at the risk of scaring people away because they're just not at that level yet. So I would say bide your time. If you've had some good programs, don't worry yet about the depth until you have been able to build the trust long enough. And I, I really think. For most clubs, it takes a good three years or so uh, of consistent HMV before they're going to get to that point. But again, you know, any of these questions down the road, you know, myself or you know the HMV committee or mentioned would be happy to try to maybe help you craft a program that would make sense that you're still sure, Craig. Right, Dave Handler is asking. Should men's clubs not try to be in competition with each other to attract potential shul and men's club members? How do you referee these I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of the question. Sorry about that. My bad. For members and active members. He's referencing that men's club uh, must, uh, should men's club not try to be in competition with each other to attract potential shul and men's club members? How do you referee these dynamics when concerned? I'm not sure that's really going to be an HMB kind of question that I can answer, except to say that uh, I, I guess I'm with you and that I don't think we need to be competing. I think our goal really, you know, everybody, you know, I, I would never want to encroach on another show or try to poach members from them. I think our job really is to try to find the unaffiliated members and help them understand 
why belonging to your club, to your shul, is a great thing. Anybody who then becomes actively involved, clearly, you know, that's a gain for every single one of us. I think that's where I'd be focusing my attention. And I will tell you, HMV is another, another one of those programs where we do not require anybody to be a member of our club to participate. We've actually had a number of people, sometimes we publicize them community-wide, We've had people come who have not belonged to our synagogue, who have not belonged to our brotherhood, who've come to some of those and started to meet people, and that's uh, encouraged them to get involved and ultimately to join. Again, with this one, I, I would say let's focus in on those who are currently unaffiliated and uh, try to get them uh, more involved rather than look at this very sticky situation you're raising about you know, competing with other uh, shoals or clubs. Michael Miller is asking, how do you bring men oh, in their 60s again, great question. Their 40s into the same So the trick general. here is to take a look at the topics that you're going to be selecting. So some of the choices you're going to be making, you know, things to discuss are specifically going to appeal to a younger audience. Some are going to appeal to an older audience. Um, again, once your program gets established enough, I think people become very comfortable talking together generally, generationally. However, I think in the beginning, my guess is that you may do better trying to find a few tailored discussions that are specifically going to attract, you know, a, a certain age group. So, we can talk about the parenting issue, for example. So, you can easily run a, a multi-part series in which you know, you start out with parenting the very young child and dealing with the challenges that might be faced. So this is going to appeal to those guys who may be in their 30s or their 40s. Then you can deal with the issues of your children moving away, dating, inter-dating, intermarriage, uh, which will appeal to those who may be more in their 50s and then start into the 60s. And then you can do a program on, you know, grandparenting. One of the ways to engage the different generations at the same time is to not only talk about people's experience of being a grandparent, but you can always start out by getting the discussion about what do you remember about your relationship with your own grandparents? And what are your expectations of when you may become a grandparent? Or if you become a grandparent, what are the, the experiences that you face? This is a wonderful way to shape it so that there's room for everybody at the table. And again, I think as your programs develop over time, it will be much, much easier to have all those groups sitting down together. But in the very beginning, I'd consider setting up programs that are tailored to touch on a variety of different uh, generations or decades uh, of men. And eventually, if they have a good time at one, they may come to the next. Barry Landau is asking, do the clubs that do HMV have an officer or board member designated to handle the HMV program? His club is hard pressed to do their current agenda. I don't think you have to, personnel. although I do think in the long run you'll be happy volunteers. if you find at least a couple of people who really think HMV is something that's going to be important for your club and give them a leadership role. Again, for clubs that are just starting out, to do you know two or three in a year would be fantastic. You know, the beautiful part about HMB programs is that the budget for it is basically zero. It doesn't cost anything to run any of these programs. These are also programs that do phenomenally well with a small group. So eight to ten people attending is the ideal size. So you don't need to have a large club or a large shul. Again, I told you a story about a club that was nearest that was small, so small they couldn't do their own, so we just invited them to join in. I think, you know, if you can get a couple of people who really say, you know, this year we're going to commit to doing HMV. If you're really strapped, one of the things I would encourage you to do is tap into our HMV mention. Those men who have been trained to facilitate and help different clubs get started. So that's an easy way to get assistance without burdening your membership in the least. If you can get a couple of guys from your club, though, um, we, you know, eventually all these kind of materials will, will show up in the FJMC website. You know, the roles you can give them can be very, very small, such as hosting. You know, somebody who's just willing to have a meeting at their, you know, an HMV at their house. That's a very important role and a way for somebody to feel like they've taken on, 
you know, some kind of leadership position without giving very much of their time. Um, by getting a couple of guys, though, ideally, who would be identified as uh, your HMB leaders, um, I think in the long run, you're going to attract many, many more people to the program. And I think, you know, with uh, more minds, you get better ideas, too, uh, more creative thinking. So I think it's ideal for those who are really struggling, tap into the existing group of the HMB committee, the HMB mention, uh, the consultants through FJMC, and they'd be more than willing to help you, as I mentioned to, I, I think it was Craig or it was Barry, actually. Um, you know, you can get guys from other congregations who are leading HMB to come to your show probably and lead it. So there's, again, minimal effort involved. All you'd have to do is publicize. So those are a few ideas. Rob Levine is asking, what are your thoughts on including clergy at HMV yes. sessions? Yes, it has to. There's no question about it. The there are some clubs discussion. in which their uh, religious leaders get very involved. Um, we have made a, a pretty conscious decision in our club to not involve them. Our thought was, this is just our thought, and again, it's wide open to whatever works in your system, you know, because many different religious leaders have very, you know, different personalities too. But there's no way you can have your core religious leader there and not have it have an impact on uh, the comfort level people may have about speaking things. However, what I will say, for those clubs where uh, rabbis in particular have gotten very involved, they find it's a wonderful way to, for them to connect to, um, to the membership and to get to know guys on a much better level. Again, in our club we've decided not to try to encourage uh, our, our rabbi or cantor to participate. Uh, and they understand this. We do not hold any of our sessions in our shul. Um, and uh, we find that there, there are certainly discussions that we've had in which oftentimes we've actually discussed our clergy, that no way uh, people would have been uh, comfortable talking about that if those leaders were in the room. Also, some of the discussions have gotten uh, a little off color at times. You know, I think people just may feel a little bit more at ease without them there. But again, that's based on the clergy that we have. Uh, who are a little more formal in those clubs where there are clergy who are, you know, much more contemporary. They may feel very comfortable and would like to be involved. I know that's true of a number of clubs. So I think it's more a personality issue uh, looking at who your religious leaders are to help determine if it makes sense to involve them or not. Dave Hendler asks about should HMV be tied into the daily minion challenge and getting a quorum? How does that fit into everything? Um, you know, we've been talking about this, and this is part of what areas. I was saying we'd like to see happen, you know, going out two years, is how can we use HMV in small ways to make a difference? Clearly, one of the things that we find is programs that have very strong hearing men's voices program create a very, very tight network of men. For those shoals who are having a difficult time getting a minion, I think potentially utilizing HMV may be a wonderful way to help build a sense of connection and a sense of, ooh, I'm really counted on to be here because I know people are going to be talking about something important. Um, we've been trying to encourage people who went to the convention to consider using the rapid engagement model as a way to engage people right after services or during services. You can use it as a way to uh, discuss uh, part of a parsha that came up, or a prayer, or what somebody has been going through. There's no reason you cannot take, <coughs> excuse me, five minutes at the end of a minion and uh, sit down and talk about something that's pressing for a member of your community. I think what you're going to find is that's going to build the spirit of community, and again, that sense of closeness, the sense of trust. You know, as we were saying earlier. One of the things that we can do to try to help man thrive in the uh, 21st century is to provide structures, frameworks for men to engage and to speak. And by providing a little bit of talking time, uh, you know, built into a minion somewhere, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, I know in our show we combine the, a little bit of that with little schnapps. So uh, there's always a lachaim uh, going on, and uh, that makes it much easier for uh, some people to talk as well.
Alex Romano is asking, can you share some successful Well, I think that there's a, a wide range, Alex, that you can go into. Uh, we have tried to use a variety of different media, and I think clubs are constantly experimenting with this. Um, traditionally, we've come up with a brochure format. Uh, we did a, uh, you know, I think one of the ones that worked best was a trifold that had the entire year's worth of HMB. And for us, a typical year's worth is six sessions. We do it, uh, you know, pretty much <clears throat> six months in a row, starting usually in, you know, say November-ish, October, November. We wait till after the holidays. And in some of our best years, what we did was we put that flyer out on every single seat during the high holidays. Inevitably, I know this will come as a shock to some of you, uh, inevitably almost every member at some point uh, would become bored with services and they would read whatever reading material was sitting on their uh, chair. And so uh, we got great opportunity to have the entire synagogue uh, learn about our HMB program. We also then have taken that and we put it online. Uh, we have done the best way to get people is one to one invite. Uh, so you talk to somebody during Kiddush one Shabbos and say, hey, you know, we're going to have this great program coming up in a couple of weeks. How about if you come with me? I'll give you a ride. It's the most successful strategy you'll ever find. We use phone calls. Uh, we have uh, now added uh, things to, um, uh, let's see, um, we've, we've added it to our, we have a, a Google calendar in which we put it on that. What we're trying to do is uh, send uh, mobile text reminders to guys about these coming up. Um, we've also, at different times, had write-ups. We always would put write-ups in our uh, synagogue news bulletin. We also have them announced from the pulpit uh, on Shabbos during the announcement. So it's a bunch of different strategies you can try. Benny Summerfield's um, asking if we do this at Minion or after services when both men and women are present, um, should both genders be invited or will the dynamics be off if, if HMB you know, it's again it's a great question. Um, and Benny also he just sent me a text too talking about uh, in the board that uh, the using uh, HMB strategies uh, and specifically maybe the rapid engagement model. Uh, during board meetings is a very, very effective way to achieve a great deal uh, of getting people to start to think creatively about topics uh, when they might not have, have they just kind of gone on the way they have been going. Um, I think you can certainly have a discussion group that involves men and women. I don't see a problem with that. I would not call it an HMV, you know, but anytime we're encouraging men to uh, talk uh, to one another and with women about important topics. I think that um, you know, even though the, the dynamic is going to be good, it's positive. We're just trying to help develop the skill of listening, talking, and creating deeper communication. So, as far as I'm concerned, anything we can do with any group will help. And chances are, if men have that experience in Minion and they start to feel more comfortable, it will be much easier to get them to an official Hearing Men's Voices program. Okay, I think uh, just if we didn't have a chance to answer your question, if I missed your question in the chat box, I'm sure Paul or sure. anyone else on the HMV committee will be more than willing to speak with you offline. Okay, uh, thanks, Dave. Um, I think I'm going to ask Art if he'd like to make a concluding comment because he's been uh, on the day that he had to move from the Cape back to. Um, Back to New York, he's been sitting on his iPhone, participating. So, Art, Art, would you like to make a uh, make a comment? Hello. Hi. I'm 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 getting my mute off. Hold on. Um, Paul, um, I I think you've you've set the bar really high. Uh, for the coming year. Um, I, I just love the way that you fielded so many questions uh, with so much experience. Um, you're going to have a great year. FJMC is going to have a great year. Hearing Men's Voice is going to have a great year. Um, what a wonderful way to begin it. Uh, 
Uh, Shana Tova, everyone. Okay, thank you so much for participating, Art, on this day, busy day for you, and uh, <laughs> I'm glad you could be with us. Uh, <laughs> Paul, do you have any? Con Nothing Paul, do you have any concluding to that if we want to, to make, and then I'll wrap it up. There's great hope for uh, men in the conservative movement. You know, it's you know the organization of FJMC and the brotherhoods and the men's clubs out there, and the work that every single one of you who's listening in does. It really is inspiring to me and helps me believe that we really are uh, going to be on the increase in terms of involvement and the kind of roles we can play. Um, just seeing what happened at the convention, the role we're playing now in Masorti Judaism, this is a dramatic, dramatic change and a, a big improvement. So I'm very enthused. Uh, after coming after the convention, I was totally psyched. And I'm very much looking forward to working with as many of you as possible over the next two years. Thank you uh, again, Bob, for all the work you've done. Uh, Muzzle tub to Miles on his uh, starting, you know, his uh, administration with the bang. I really appreciate it. And uh, all the best to every single one of you for a healthy, happy new year. Thank you so much, Paul. And just as we wrap up, I'm going to wish everybody a happy new year. Lashana Tova, and ask you to um, come back uh, right after the holidays. Hopefully, we'll be pu publishing a schedule of the upcoming webinars. Uh, I'd like to do uh, about one a month, if possible, uh, on um, uh, relevant topics of the of that time of the year. And our my. Email for the webinars is training at fjmc.org. So if you'd like me to send you a, a link when this video is up uh, on YouTube, we will be we're recording it. We'll put it up on YouTube, and also I'm sure uh, Paul would be glad to share the um, the PowerPoint uh, with anyone who, who requests it. So the uh, the contact uh, address is training at fjmc. Dot org if you want to get on our mailing list. Take care. And, uh, good night. Thank thanks you so much. Thank you very much. Again. And thanks for joining us. And good night.